So I got very interested in .NET Interactive when it was first called Try.NET, and Try.NET still exists. Um, it is a project that allows you, uh, it's being used on the .NET documentation site so that when you see a code snippet right there, you can, there's a way to just try it right there. And there's a, basically, I, I believe they're using Blazor to go out to a compiler, compile your code real quick, run it and show you the results. And it's pretty cool. And that's, that is, uh, .NET Interactive was born out of that, um, from what I understand, but try.NET is in a different repository now. So um, the home the home for .NET Interactive is on GitHub in the .NET uh, organization, the repo is interactive. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste this over into our Teams chat, just in case people are looking for it. And I think the star of .NET Interactive is Notebooks which many people, uh, when they just synonymously think of Jupyter Notebooks and Notebooks, and that's because the whole idea of Notebooks began with, with the Jupyter server, um, which you can install locally, and then you'll have these uh, this experience of being able to write text and code together in little cells that we're gonna do in a little bit and execute that code in each cell as you wish. But as you execute the code, the state of your whole notebook is being being stored somewhere. It's it's kind of like a REPL sort of experience, except uh, which is that which is that interactive uh, window that we have in F Sharp for sure. You can see it in Visual Studio. There is a C Sharp interactive window, or if you're maybe coming from Python, there's a REPL there. Some other languages have REPLs where you just type a command in and it says okay, and it's just kind of you're kind of building your programming environment line by line. Um, notebooks builds on that experience. And what I found, I got really interested when notebooks showed up in Visual Studio Code, number one. And then what really got me interested is when .NET showed up. And I said, oh, this is really a cool idea. Um, our friend Jeff Fritz uses this today. He does a weekly series over on the .NET channel on YouTube. So that's youtube.com slash D-O-T-N-E-T. It's also broadcast on Twitch. Um, and he does this every Mondays, every Monday. And he is using this .NET Interactive Notebook so that not only does he write the code with the attendees live, he ends up with this when he's done. And I can view it right here on GitHub where he's using Markdown to provide documentation so it's almost like he's writing a C-sharp book on the fly. And then when it comes time to show an example, these cells are examples that are runnable. So um, I don't know that they're runnable inside GitHub, but you could clone this repository and then run them in Visual Studio Code, which in a little bit, I'm gonna, gonna start at the beginning in Visual Studio Code and talk about everything that has to be installed, and, and what you would need to do, whether you wanted to follow along or to try to do this another time. But if you bring these notes, so GitHub will render the notebook and it will render the code, which is cool, like a readme type file, a readme.md. But if you bring this down into your .NET Interactive kernel, or uh, you can run it on certain, some websites will pick up GitHub repos and run them for you. I think Binder is the name of it. Um, you know, you can execute as if you were here watching his show live. It might be great to follow along. I think there's a potential here to have on-demand documentation and 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 code so that maybe maybe you have a library that you use internally or you built internally. It's in NuGet. And you could say to people, hey, here's the docs. Oh, and you can try stuff out right here. So it might be something that will be easier to understand when we actually see an example. Um, there's there's a little animated GIF here showing us how things work. But if you're on the .NET Interactive site, which again, I, I feel like the home for this is at, at GitHub's .NET Interactive repo, and you click on Notebooks, this is where they, they say, okay, we, we have the .NET Interactive Notebooks extension, which is something you need to install in Visual Studio Code. And Visual Studio Code itself natively supports Notebooks now, but Notebooks, um, the vast majority of notebooks are written in Python. I think that's fair to say. 
And so if all you do is install Visual Studio Code and install Python 3, 3.1 is the latest, you can begin creating, uh, you could create a file with the, this extension IPYNB and start writing Python cells and, and, and using Python notebooks that you might see other people doing on the web. But what if you wanted to use some of our favorite languages like C-sharp? Well, that's where .NET Interactive comes in. So you will need Visual Studio Code. I'm looking to see if they have their instructions here. It doesn't look like they're right here. At least I'm not seeing it uh, in notebooks, .NET Interactive notebooks. OK, yeah. So when I clicked on that link, it brought me to the, the marketplace. You don't have to come to the marketplace to install this. You can install the extension right in Visual Studio Code. But you'll need Visual Studio Code. You're going to want .NET 5, .NET 5 SDK installed. Um, if you have .NET 6 previews, that works. I have seen some strange instances where .NET Interactive fails to start. And my belief is that it's trying to start the .NET 6 SDK. So what I've done is I closed down Visual Studio Code, opened it back up, and everything's been fine. Maybe we will see that tonight. Maybe we won't. And then you install the .NET Interactive Notebooks extension from the marketplace. And once you do that, you're ready to go. So I have Visual Studio Code. Let me let me open a new Visual Studio Code window and bring that over here. So this is a brand new Visual Studio Code window. I'm going to hit Control Plus once so we get a a, a view, a zoomed in view. Um, since I think this is the kind of thing that probably makes more sense once we see the first sample, I, I'm going to open a file, show you how to create a file. Do that kind of slowly if you're following along. If you want to see how to install that extension, here's the extension here, .NET Interactive Notebook. So you could come up here and type .NET Interactive, and it should zoom into it. You want that installed. You do need the .NET 5 SDK installed, which that's a download and an install on Windows, right? And if you are if you don't have that ready, then um, it won't come up right away. But all you have to do to get started is, is I, I need a folder. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to create a folder. Um, I like to put things, for me, I like to put them in a folder. Everything, all my sources in this folder called, just called source. And so to keep things simple, I'm just going to type philly.net here, philly, D-O-T, N-E-T. So that means I'm creating a folder on the C drive, backslash source, backslash philly.net. Oh, it says I got to create it first. So what I really am going to do is hit new folder and name that new folder philly.net and hit enter on it. And this is fine. This is what I want. So if you're not used to this experience in Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code is now using philly.net. There's no files in here at all. If, if you like command line, here's the Windows terminal. I already made the philly.net folder. You saw me do that. So one easy way to start Visual Studio Code from any folder that you're in is just code dot. And it says, OK. And it'll, it'll open up Visual Studio Code in that folder. But I don't have any files in here. No files at all. Um, wow, that's pretty old school, right? Hitting dir in the console. Some people like to hit start dot and get a get an explorer window, but I don't have any files. So if you're at this point, the first thing to do to make a, a notebook is to create what I call it, a, a file with the IPYNB extension. So it's not a three letter extension, it's five. <laughs> And I'm just going to create a notebook called notebook. Dot IPYNB. And by doing that, Visual Studio Code, because I have this extension installed, it automatically it automatically recognizes it as a notebook. And more importantly, because I have the .NET 5 SDK installed, I can start typing, I'm going to be able to start typing C sharp code in here and executing it. Um, you get a little bit of a command deck up here. Mm -hmm. 
you can uh you can add a code cell add a markdown cell we'll look at that in a little bit you can run all the cells and then also what's more important is you can select your kernel so um i should have probably had this slide up and running but uh let me see if i can find it very quickly they do have a slide here where they talk about how this works and this is not it maybe it's here no it wasn't uh unfortunately oh no actually i may have i may have just stumbled upon it okay so <clears throat> this slide will make everybody's head hurt right you look at all these arrows i don't want to focus on the whole slide what i want to focus on is dotnet interactive works by containing kernels there is a c sharp kernel based on the roslyn compiler there's an f sharp kernel which is based on the already existing f sharp interactive they're using a they're using powershell to create a powershell kernel and then they worked with the folks on the sql team to create a sql kernel there's also a kernel that proxies to allow javascript and html support so this is really all i care about is that all these different things can work together in one .NET interactive notebook. So back over here, what made this a .NET interactive notebook? Number one, the extension in being installed. Number two, I created a file with the IPYNB extension. And number three, I do have the .NET 5 SDK installed. But I can't write any .NET until I come up here to the right and select a kernel. So I move my mouse to the upper right where it says select kernel. There, there is probably a command in the command palette for this. Command palette in Visual Studio Code of Control Shift P, and you get to see, you know, you get to see um, all these commands related to .NET Interactive. But I know that I can click here, and when I click on that, in the middle top, it's asking me like, okay, well, do you want the Python kernel, which is a traditional Jupyter Notebooks kernel, or do you want .NET Interactive? I want .NET Interactive. So the first thing it does is it says, OK, you are now in a .NET Interactive notebook, and the language you're using is C Sharp. When I brought my mouse over, you might notice that it highlighted a little bit here. I can click, and I can pick from these different languages. Um, I am not familiar with this. Maybe this is a new addition. but you know, you can pick, pick C sharp, F sharp, and we'll see later HTML, JavaScript, and so on. So it really is as easy as you might think. Um, I can type console dot right line. Hello world, just like we always do. And uh, I'm getting IntelliSense. It's telling me everything I ever wanted to know about console dot right line. And this cell now contains this code. But it's it'll execute if I run the cell. So how do I run the cell? Well, over to the left, we see a button that looks a lot like a play button, and it says execute cell. If you're sitting in the cell, there's a shortcut control alt enter. So you can click that run button anytime. And dot net interactive checks the code out and compiles it and there's my answer hello world and that's it I've, I've started on a .NET interactive notebook um, let's imagine maybe you're writing documentation so I might want to have some markdown so I can add a markdown cell now this cell is instead of being you know code that's executed in C sharp I might use the the traditional uh, you know, welcome to .NET Interactive. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying that I want this to be, I want this to be a, uh, you know, the, the biggest heading because I only put one pound sign there or hash sign is, if, I, I wonder if there's a an age where it's a hash sign and not a pound sign, right? When I stop editing the cell, it renders it. So how did I stop editing? I click the check mark. If I come back to the to the pencil edit cell, it turns it back into markdown. So I could start working on some kind of notebook that maybe is a little bit of 
of explanation, a little bit of code. I can pick up this notebook, see how you might be able to see how my cursor changed to a hand. This should work where I should be able to hold with left click. I should be able to drag this up. Uh, of course, watch. I know I can do it. Let's see. Uh, Toggle cell two part position. I was pretty sure. Maybe I have to do this first. Yeah, maybe that was it. Okay. I don't think I could be editing it. So editing with by clicking the pencil, pushing the check mark to turn it back into a markdown cell. Then I can grab it. And I think by bringing that blue line up above the previous cell, it should drop it off. So I, I'm beginning to maybe build something that might be useful for other people to look at, right? Um, Console.writeline doesn't seem too useful of a of a cell i mean it displayed some stuff but that's not that's not too complicated so what if i added another cell and i uh, i add a code cell here um i can do something really simple like say just var x equals five that's going to end up being uh an int right and in fact i'm still getting intellisense here I hover over the var keyword, and it's telling me that type inference is going to make this an int, just like I was in Visual Studio Code or I was in Visual Studio. I can run this cell, and it will set x to 5 in the, in the C-sharp kernel, but you're not going to see anything. So if you've typed in var x equals 5 and you click execute cell, yeah, the little check mark appears, and it says, yep, I have... I've done it. I've done what you said, but you may not really see um, anything. You know, to you, it's like, well, I don't, I don't understand what was the use of that. So I can do other things here. I don't have to create a full blown class to start writing writing functions. So what if I say public uh, int add, and the add function takes, of course, one uh to make it not confusing i'll say int x and int b so it takes an it takes two integers and i think we can all guess what we're going to do here we will we'll say return a plus b and now i have a function i could call that's that's pretty nice what if i now said well let's write that out console dot write line and we say add, and let's go ahead and use X for one of the parameters, and we'll use uh, four for the second parameter. So we expect that console.write line to write nine. Now that I'm displaying something, I can hit execute cell, and sure enough, the cell compiles, executes, and we get the value nine. There's one other way to display things it's kind of personal preference wh which way you might like. There's a built-in display command or display function that's just display. And so in this case, I'm just going to say display X, just whatever's in the value X. Now, <clears throat> it fools you for a little bit. And now watch, let's see, let's hope it doesn't make a fool out of me. You see that red squiggly and you say, ah, that's not going to work, Chris. I mean, you got a red squiggly there. That's the universal don't, don't run sign so i'm going to click it and sure enough we have the output from console.writeline showing here but the display kind of says like hey the cell's display value is five and so here it is i, I had both things print out so um the reason i point out display is i happen to notice that our good friend jeff tends to use display and i for some and i actually have no good explanation for this i can't give you any pro or con other than that i i kind of like continuing to write out of the .NET base class library, so I do console.writeline when I write these. I, I have, I can't, I'm not telling you, it, it's not an endorsement either way. So now that you've seen the beginning of this, I, I'm gonna pause for a second and ask if there are any questions before we see some more things. If you might be looking at this right now and say like, okay, I kind of see you working here, but can it do more useful things? And the, the answer is yes, but I wanted to, to give a second. Let me make sure that I've got get all my notes back on top here. And 
and get ready to go on to the next part. So, all right. So, um, using values from previous cells, we have a value X equals five there. If I start another cell, I think this should be pretty straightforward. You might be wondering what happens if I just uh, if I just do nothing more than console.writeLine x here. Is it going to pick the x up from the other cell? Well, in this case, the, the answer is yes, and it's going to print 5 because we set x to 5 back there um, because we've already executed that cell. So earlier we, we ran the code and we said, hey, let's set x to 5. So then when we run the second cell, that line of code is going to work. Now, I can say clear outputs of all cells. I may actually have to do one more thing. I don't know that that resets the kernel. Just clearing the output of the cells got rid of all of the uh, all of the results. I'm going to do nothing more than just click the run button again, and it still works. Well, the reason why it still works is because backing all of this is a C sharp kernel that has been running the whole time, and we haven't reset it. So I believe reset is sitting in this more actions menu. If not, we can find it in the command palette. And I'm not finding it there. So great chance to use Visual Studio Code's built in command palette. Control Shift P if you're on a Mac. I think it's Command Shift P, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and here it is here. Here's the command right here. Restart the current notebooks kernel. If it if it didn't show up right away, I could start typing .NET Interactive. And I would see now it's focused in on just the commands that apply to .NET Interactive. So I'll say restart the current notebooks kernel. And this now, this should, watch, let's hope this, this does what I expect. Now that we've reset the kernel, this should now not work. If I just come down here and push this button, it should be a syntax error because it says, hey, X doesn't exist. The current context, the current kernel, nobody ever declared a value for X. You didn't run any code that set that up. So I could, you know, very quickly execute this one and then execute this and we're back to where we were. So that's just a real quick uh, demonstration that like the C sharp kernel cell by cell is building up um, the variables and building up functions to call. You know, I've got that add function that I could call in a cell now because it's declared there. Um, in fact, I should be able to do that from here. If I change this to add three, four, and we get seven, works fine. But that other cell had to be executed in order to kind of to get that into the kernel. So um, next up is this is called .NET Interactive, not C Sharp Interactive. And there are other .NET languages, right? Let me double check to make sure there's nothing in the chat. I know Bill had mentioned about Custo queries, and I appreciate that. Azure Data Explorer, I'll have to look into that. Um, I'm going to create another cell, a code cell, but this time I'm going to move over to the right, and I'm going to I'm going to change this to an F sharp cell by clicking on this uh, where it says C sharp .NET Interactive. Let me change it to an F sharp cell. Okay. So now, even if you don't know any F sharp, this should this should be pretty clear what it's doing. Um, if I say print F and I use a little percent D, which is like a placeholder for a for a number, uh, and let's say um, the variable X was, and it's gonna be, we're gonna say percent D, and then I gotta tell it what I want. I want X. I want you to take X from earlier up, X equals five, I want you to take that and I want you to print it out. The variable was, the variable X was five. And so if I do that and I run, it doesn't work. It says, hey, X is not defined. So that might be a little puzzling at first. Like, well, why didn't that work? If you remember the diagram I showed earlier, F sharp interactive is its own kernel. So the F sharp kernel is separate from the C sharp kernel. 
that may be frustrating for you. You may be exactly what you want to hear, um, but they're separate kernels. So if I do nothing other than what you see here, I can't just start using X. And that that might seem frustrating. So can I do something about that? Well, I can. Uh, Notebooks has a concept of magic commands. And magic commands consist of the commands that start pound, exclamation mark. I make that just a touch bigger. Hopefully that's not, that's much better, easier to see. And the magic command that I want to share a variable from the C-sharp kernel is share dash dash from C-sharp. And then I got to say, well, what variable do I want? And I want X. So what I'm saying is, is, is go reach out, grab X from the C-sharp kernel. And now that I've done this, this should be enough for the code to execute correctly. Variable X was five. So um, this allows you to do some interesting things like uh, maybe you're learning one or the other mm -hmm. languages, but you know the other one pretty well. You might set up some scenario in C sharp, share it over to F sharp and then say, well, let me practice looking at, uh, let me practice looking at how a C sharp class looks in F sharp. How does that look? You know, is do you access it the, access it the same way, not the same way? How do I call member um, or what might be more interesting is if you're really into F sharp and you say, now, how is my F sharp module or my F sharp type? How is that going to look in C sharp? How does that look? This might be a way for you to declare some stuff in F sharp, share it over to C sharp and then say, OK. Let's see. Uh, let's see how it looks for the C sharp developer. I actually. Um, a little while ago, I, I don't I don't work in this position anymore, but I was supporting an F sharp library. And yet, so this library was written in F sharp. I was supporting it. At least 99.9% .9 of the projects in this massive enterprise company were all C sharp. So the number one question knocking down my door was, how do I use this F sharp library? I don't understand. So it might have been nice to have interactive notebooks and to be able to say, hey, you know, uh, go take a look at this notebook. You can run the code right from there. That would have been pretty cool. So. Okay, so what else can we do? Um, let's take a look at some of my other notes here. Oh man, I have that chair up here. I don't want that. Where is the? Here it is. All right. Uh, okay, so. What else can we do that's interesting here? Let's uh, let's try creating a list in the F sharp kernel, and then we will we will print it out in the C sharp kernel. But this time I want to do something a little different. I want to show a different magic command. So I'm going to create a totally different cell, and I'm not. I don't want to use. Uh, I don't want to use these these buttons to explicitly declare what each cell is. So instead I'm going to use I'm going to use a magic command and I can say this cell is F sharp. Uh, did I do that backwards? No, I did that fine. This shell is F sharp and I'm going to need um, if I want to use a list, I'm going to need system dot collections dot generic. If I was in C sharp, I would do using system dot collections dot generic. And if I say this is kind of like kind of like saying var list uh, is a new list of string this is very very similar to that code and this is going to be a list of strings so i want to add some i want to add something to it let's add this little bit of code here and then um in f sharp you can return a value just by just by typing it out uh, the last line of, of a method if you just kind of say here's the value you don't even have to write the word return. So I'm returning list here. Oops, I didn't mean to open another, didn't mean to open another cell. I just wanted to get that IntelliSense out of the way. So um, it's not super important to understand what this does, but but let's see when I run it. I get a formatted list. So .NET Interactive is looking at this list of strings and saying, I can render that. And it renders it out as a table 
showing you index and the value, which is kind of nice, right? Now you don't have to go write a bunch of code to render simple things. You, you know, it's not gonna go crazy, but maybe you have a list of things from a project and, and it will render that out for you. So now, what if I want my next cell, which I'll push the plus button to create another cell again. I want this to be a C-sharp cell, cell that uses that list. So first, I am not going to change to C-sharp interactive using uh, the lower right corner click. I'm going to create a magic command and say C-sharp. So I have switched over and um, let's say I need to share because that's in the F-sharp kernel. So I want to share from the F sharp kernel. I want to share the list variable. That's this value that was that was bound here. I even get IntelliSense to tell me that list is a list of string. Heck, it even it even puts in a little IntelliSense comment there. What's currently in the, the list? That's pretty amazing. So um, now that I'm in C sharp. I can use the, the the list, the add function again, the add method out of the list class. And I can say, well, this one was added by C-sharp. We gotta have our semicolons in C-sharp. And let me do exactly what I did over there and just type the word list so that I can let F-sharp interactive pick this up. And let's see, this should all work. So now F-sharp interactive says, okay, I printed the list because it's the last thing you, you put in there. So borrowing a little bit from F-sharp there, that is not a C-sharp feature. Uh, it's not a C-sharp 10 feature. I don't think it's on any proposal of any kind. It's just, this. that's a notebooks feature there where it says, I know what to do with that list. I know that I can show you index by index and I can show you the values in there. And it said added by C-sharp, added by F-sharp. What should happen is if I come back up here and run this again, actually I can't run this again from F-sharp because F-sharp's declaring it and F-sharp will get really cranky about trying to do that again. So I should be able to run this again from C-sharp land. And it does kind of what we expected. It says, well, the list already had a string added by F-sharp, added by C-sharp. So now we've, we've added a second one added by C-sharp. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty interesting that I can start bringing stuff across from different languages. Uh, let me see if I can show a JavaScript example, if I can find it in my notes real quick here. This I think is one of the most interesting things. Okay, this isn't it. That's not the file that I had it in. I have it. Sorry about this. Okay. I think. I do have. How do I import? Well, I'm going to have to remember. Okay. So we have. Um, let's see. What do we have? We have this value X all the way up here, we know it's five, right? So if I come down, I can create a JavaScript cell and uh, I can share from, um, from C sharp. And remember way back at the top, we have an X. And then the way you do this is you say, where is it? It's interactive. Isn't there a pound before the the exclamation? Oh yes, that's right. I didn't get the magic command exactly right. I need I need the pound exclamation, and then of course IntelliSense is helping me to say share from C sharp. Let me just run this real quick to make sure I have it right. No, I don't have it right. Where is my, oh, okay, I got it now. So I was trying to remember how you pull variables across. So we saw that in the .NET kernels, once you share, they're accessible. And thanks for 
catching that missing pound, Bill. Once you share, they're accessible. In the JavaScript kernel, a little bit different. We have to still go retrieve it. And the way you do that is they add a little object into the kernel called interactive. And you say that you want it from C sharp. And you say get variable. Uh, actually, maybe I don't even need the share. Is that right? I may not even need the share. Um, get variable X. And I can just say, let me see if I say console.log. So I can print all that stuff out. Okay, so it is that. Get variable x r y equals. So what is the token that it's complaining is not? Oh, uh, no. I thought I had it, and yet, where's my working example here? Ah, uh, well, shoot. Because what, what's really neat about this is that your JavaScript could then update HTML, but for some reason I can't get the syntax right. So I may not be able to show that one. Um, and for some reason I can't seem to find the complete sample. All right, we'll, we'll move on from there. Sorry about that. If I happen to run across it as I'm looking through these, then we'll be able to come back to it. Okay. I don't want that window. All right. So something I want you to be able to do is I want everybody, before we run out of time, I want to make sure that people can try some more advanced samples. Because um, to be able to follow along with stuff like this is pretty cool. But there are samples in the .NET interactive space that are pretty impressive, and they will run on your machine right now. So uh, everybody knows how to use Git. So if you do, I say everybody knows how to use Git, but if you do nothing more, let me bring the interactive notebooks over here. If you do nothing more, then, then clone the repo. You can clone it here from GitHub Desktop, from GitHub, use Visual Studio, use whatever it is you like. And you say git clone, and you do nothing more than this, which I've already done, so I'm not actually going to run the command. Then you will get a folder called interactive. And inside this folder, there is a samples folder. So with me sitting in C source, interactive samples because I cloned it to my C source folder. I want to open up Visual Studio Code right here. So code dot. And these, a couple of these samples are some of the more impressive uh, uses of, of the polyglot features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it's complaining, right? So, Let's take a look at their COVID-19 example. So the reason I want to show this example is because everybody can leave here, can clone this repo, come right to this same exact sample. I'll show you where it is in GitHub. What I did is, is after cloning the repo, I opened Visual Studio Code in the samples folder. You don't have to open it in the samples folder. You could open it in the root and then go into the samples folder. The key is opening this COVID-19 sample. Because what's really neat about it as a polyglot sample is it's also bringing in PowerShell. So here's a PowerShell cell that all it's really going to do is it's kind of like a curl command. It's going to just do this web request and save it to different CSVs. So there's different comma separated files that are out there ready to get. And you execute this cell. And I, I guess I got to tell it I never came up here to select a kernel. So it's asking me. When I tried to execute a cell, it says, wait a second, wait a second, what, what 
kernel do I use for this notebook? I say, I want .NET Interactive. So it's so, okay, fine. Run that, and it's actually going out, making a web request, and bringing down those three files, which it brought into the same folder that we're working in. So I now have these comma-separated files. If you are already building, if you're building runbooks today, um, you have a folder with scripts, maybe to run PowerShell commands or even little C-sharp utilities. What if you had this stuff in a notebook so that you could put documentation right next to it and say, hey, this little PowerShell snippet that I always have to remember where I left it, it's saved in a GitHub repo and I can execute it and go one by one down some kind of run book or some kind of, uh, some kind of pattern. So first we started off in, in PowerShell just to get the files down, then, in the C-sharp, this kind of reminds me a little bit of the new C-sharp 10 feature top-level statements, although it's not exactly the same thing. I don't have to create a program class. I don't have to create a main method. That stuff is, is ready for you. It says, okay, I, I want to declare a clean method. I didn't, it doesn't even have to say public void. That's all just going to be inferred as, as working in this cell. You can call it, you can bring in outside you can bring in system.io and bring in regular expressions so that it can clean up this file. That's what this is going to do. It's actually going to um, open these files using system.io and do some quick reg regex replacements to clean the CSV files up. And hey, if you're in data science, there's definitely going to be a lot of that. Now, here is an awesome command that we didn't look at earlier. This command allows you to import packages from NuGet. That's really cool. So we're not just stuck with what's what's already built in to uh, notebooks, what's already being brought in for us. This particular example wants to use the Microsoft Data Analysis Library. So if you execute this cell, it's going to go out and install this package into the kernel. So now the kernel's ready for this data analysis code. And the next C-sharp um, cell is going to use the data analysis library. Because earlier, let's see, where, where is it earlier? Uh, we, have, we have deaths confirmed, recovered. These values are going to be, um, they're gonna load, they're gonna load these files using the data analysis library, and then they're going to use it in order to basically fill these three different values with uh, some series data. So this doesn't take too long. It's processing all the different dates inside those files, and it's coming up with some time series data. Almost done. I'm pretty sure it's just the end of 20. Oh, no. Wow, it keeps going. Does it really go to today? I didn't think it did. When I tried this the first time, it seemed like it went much faster. But when, when you're here and you're looking and saying like, hey, I want to make sure I leave time for questions, then it seems to take much longer. Maybe it does really go up to today. It could be today's data. Yeah, it sure was. So now it's ready. So, so Chris, that yep. display value on the bottom, is that mm -hmm. related to display that you saw earlier? The displayed value. Um, no, all the way at the bottom of the code. Right. So. Um, Oh, so somehow when we look up at the top, they created a variable called displayed value that yeah. is, is using the display function. And then what they do oh, is, okay. I see it. is I they see call it. update on it. That's very clever. That's a good way yeah. to use That's so much that, better than console writes. Yeah, uh, that, that display, um, you know what? You've probably just now made the first argument that I need to say, like, why better than a console write? Because... You could update in place with update. And even though I've run this sample before, that didn't occur to me until you just said it. That you you didn't, by uh, by taking display and then hanging on to this display, this display must return, you know, something that you can update and you can call update on and you can change it, whatever. And we can see that it's processing the different dates. So that's a really good catch. And I appreciate it. And that, yeah, I, I write a lot of data uh, massage utilities in C sharp. And this, this looks really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I do like what you're saying. There's a great reason to use display. 
And if you call it and and take a reference to it, hang on to that reference, you can update the line just as if you had a real clever console rewriter, which some people write those for .NET. They write these clever console terminal rewriters. So because this data is stored in, in these three top level variables, we can now go to JavaScript and use, let me see if I can find, uh, first of all, there's more that you can do that. I, I don't wanna just focus on the interactive C-sharp get variable, but I wanna go down to it and find it. By using interactive.c-sharp.get variable and then saying, let's get the series, it can come back up here and get this variable that is a list of object. And really they just added plain old dot anonymous objects, anonymous.net objects were added to this, which look, JavaScript is perfectly fine with anonymous objects, right? Like it's the home of JSON. So by saying, go get that variable series from c -sharp land, then it can start using it to uh, to build its own JSON that it's eventually gonna print out or eventually display for us. But there's another use of interactive in here. This particular JavaScript cell says, you know what would be really cool? What if I got um, the JavaScript library Plotly and where can I get it? Well, I could just get it from its CDN. I could just go get the minimized version from it just by saying configure require. So if you're used to JavaScript and Node and so on, and you use that require method to say, go and make sure you go get this uh, library, they have a way, it's a little, it might seem a little tweaky, a little verbose, but using the interactive kernel, you can say, hey, go configure the require method to go out and get this Plotly library. I actually don't really know anything about Plotly, the person who wrote this does, they basically now have their plotly object um, and they say, hey, I've got a plot target function that I've created that knows how to do all this stuff. And then, you know, magic, magic, do this with the uh, update the plot. I don't know plotly, so I can't go through the code too, too carefully. But what's more cool is the outcome. I'm in a JavaScript cell now and I execute that cell. So maybe I'm not Maybe I kind of learn a little bit about Plotly. The cell's executed. So that means these JavaScript variables are ready. But JavaScript, in, in the HTML world, JavaScript can, can only do manipulate the DOM, right? So what if I make an HTML cell with a, and all it has in it, all it has is a div of an ID Plotly chart COVID. That's, the, that's an arbitrary name. That could be Bill or Joe or whatever, arbitrary name. Well, I can use a magic command to shift back over to JavaScript. That's probably what I was doing wrong is I didn't get the, Java, the this magic command. So I use a magic command to say, I'm starting in HTML because I clicked this button, set it to HTML. I'm shifting over to JavaScript and I'm calling notebook scope dot plot, which is a, you know, this whole point of all this code is to create a notebook scope plot function that knows how to plot this stuff using Plotly. And what I get is a little embedded web page executing my JavaScript, which got data from a series variable, a list of object that was created in C sharp. And if there's any saving, if there's anything that might be kind of nice about the JavaScript, you may or may not like this. JavaScript is very comfortable with non-typed data. All of those, all of those C sharp objects, they're they're anonymous types. If I scroll all the way back up to the C sharp, there this is just an anonymous type that was created. So it's sort of if you squint, it looks like JSON. So if you're familiar with both languages, you might be like, yeah, you might this might really appeal to you. If you are a dyed in the wool C sharp programmer, this might really bother you. <laughs> but um it's nice to be able to say, hey, I, in my notebook, I could switch to an HTML context, and then I could write a little bit of JavaScript to maybe manipulate that and output th the result in a nice looking way. Um, the question that you might have is, could I do that with a Python library? So .NET Interactive today does not support sharing to a Python cell. But if you look at their site, when they talk about future plans, they, they really are interested in getting Python into here as well. 
because, hey, Python is definitely one of the languages of data science. And there's folks who love using charting libraries out of there or maybe using data libraries out of there like pandas or something to maybe play with the data. So you could start in a language you're familiar with, or maybe you've already got this stuff working in .NET, move it over to a different different kernel, and um, and then make something really nice that users can come look at later, and they don't have to know any of this stuff. They just they're just looking at your at your markdown page, and they can go one, two, three, four. So um, that was my favorite part of notebooks is the interactive and the 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 polyglot piece, meaning different languages. I think there's real potential there. Um, as they say here, you can't run this particular notebook in binder because of um, you're trying to use an HTTP cell, I think is the reason. But when I talk about binder, um, we, we certainly don't have time to go into it in depth, but let's see. Jupyter.org slash binder allows you to open uh, notebooks directly here, and you can even give it a Git repository. And that Git repository will just be brought up, and it'll say like, oh, here's some notebooks, and it'll render them, and they're executable. But that doesn't make them .NET Interactive notebooks. If we take a real quick peek in the .NET Interactive GitHub, um, GitHub root, there is a Docker file in here. Now, this Docker file is great if you just want to run a container that can maybe be a Jupyter server or something. But Binder looks for Docker files in the root of your repo. It also looks for a couple other files too. But since it's looking for Docker files, this Docker file brings up a Jupyter notebook base image, and then it installs .NET Interactive on top of it. So your repository could have this Docker file and then have your, your .NET interactive notebooks in it. And then you could say, oh, well, launch Binder and give it the, give it the uh, link to my repository. And it takes a while. This is going to take longer. This takes a few minutes. Actually, maybe it'll be quicker than I think because it's got to boot all this up. But .NET Interactive will work through Binder. And you can try this out on your own just by going to the .NET Interactive GitHub repo, which I've already, I left it behind, right? Yeah, because I clicked that button. Right on the .NET Interactive repo homepage, you can click Launch Binder. It'll fire this thing up. You can go into the samples folder and run a fair number of these notebook samples. Some of them will tell you when they don't work. They'll say, hey, this doesn't work because we don't have something working. But that is super impressive, at least to me. So I'm a big fan of notebooks. Um, I'm still learning a lot about them every day. And uh, it's one piece of .NET Interactive that I think is really cool. And I'm looking forward to using, I really want to use it for things like documentation, internal documentation. Like I said, the C, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz is already a series of notebooks today that he creates as he's doing this stream. Right? In fact, this was the one they just did, this async await, I think was pretty, yeah, 16 days ago. So this was his stream, async await, multi-threading. So I'll stop. We're already getting close to eight. I have not gotten a chance to take a look just to see what people think. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff. I want one. Where can I buy it? <laughs> well, you can start using it now, right? Uh, <laughs> it does work. It does work. You got to have .NET 5. And here's what here's what I don't know. I do not know if with the launch of .NET 6 next week at .NET Conf, I don't know if this is going to be updated right away. I just don't know that answer. I, I would love to find out and maybe, maybe we can do that. Yeah, that would be excellent. Um, yeah, I could see so many uses for this run books and, uh, you know, if you if you work in a big enterprise, uh, this would be excellent for run books. Yeah, that whole concept of run like books, troubleshooting so, run books like, yeah, you know, you know, run this run this utility PowerShell utility pointed at this server, you know, figure out what the result is, go to on to the next step. 
we currently have that in one in one note notebooks and maybe a lot of places have it in text files right and it's not as useful there oh, um especially yeah, when it says really, things like yeah. hey <laughs> go find this server with this folder and these scripts are in this folder not very useful what if they were just right there so that's why i brought up the runbook example because i do think it's a good idea yeah um, we, we do everything in jira so okay. somebody somebody will say oh we had we had this problem four months ago they send you a link to a Jira t ticket that has 50 comments in it. <laughs> yep, yep. And yet read all the comments to figure out what somebody did to fix it. <laughs> yeah, turn it into a run book in a notebook, sitting yep. in a Git, Git repo. Um, interesting idea. What I didn't get to show, because um, it takes a little bit of setup, is the SQL support. For the SQL support, you do have to use a, there's a, they do have an example. Um, but you you bring in a new Git package that enables uh, SQL support and it works for Azure SQL too. And then you have a magic command where you put a connection string. And so what's a little tricky about that is I kind of thought, well, now how do I do this without maybe posting the credentials to my Azure SQL database? I could always throw the database away after the after our talk. Um, but uh, once you do those two things, once you execute that in a cell, you can now execute SQL and it puts um, result sets just as if you were in Azure Data Studio. It's really cool stuff. The only thing that's missing, and it's really unfortunate, is the share command does not yet support the SQL uh, kernel stuff, the SQL side of it. I don't know if that's coming. I know that that would be really amazing. Um, so what if you could- take like a result set from a query and yep. share it to C sharp and say do yep. something with it. Yep. Now people work around that today by basically writing C sharp that maybe uses either Dapper or Entity Framework and then goes out and gets it, or maybe they just use the system.data stuff and they they bring the stuff in. But and I think that's cool. But I would love to say like this is the SQL. Like this is the the SQL that makes this go. Execute that, pull the result set into another kernel. I thought that idea was so cool that I, I I started looking at the contributing section and looking at the code to be like, is this hard? I, do would I even know what to do? So uh, it's a little over my head right now, but I would certainly love to see that feature. All right, excellent job, Chris. Uh, this was fresh information. I'm sure everybody enjoyed this. Do I see a thumbs up or a clap from anybody? Yeah, we're going to keep talking about this too after Philly.net here. Um, we, uh, Rich Ross, Andy Schwamm, and I on the Dev Talk Show, um, which is at twitch.tv slash the Dev Talk Show, all one word, or on youtube.com uh, slash the Dev Talk Show. We're going to go live right after we're done here, Bill. And uh, we'll either keep talking about this or whatever people want to talk about after tonight. So, um, just letting right, people well, know that, that post we're that gonna... link to the chat if you could. Yeah, I sure will. And we're just going to have uh, a little parking lot conversation, just like uh, the good old days, right? Like we used to when it was real user groups, yes. Um, can you uh, real quickly show them .NET Conf uh, um, and remind everyone that they should uh, pay attention to that next week? You'll yeah, probably that's right. Want, you'll want this link as well, uh, everyone that's online. Uh, but this is all free stuff by the product team. And uh, so the the way it sounds to me, they're going to release .NET 6 on the 8th, which is Monday, and then the conference is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And of course, all that will be recorded, so you'll have plenty to, to look at over the uh, cold winter months. Uh, but there's so much new stuff coming out. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, and so like you said, Tuesday through Thursday is .NET Conf on Monday. They're doing a different a, a, a Visual Studio event, which I'm not sure if that's linked right on this page. I'm gonna have to take a look. Oh, if, if you look at the top, see it says save the date. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. So okay, so so yeah. I'll so show that. She in might just a be second. releasing Visual Studio 2022 on on the eighth, and then uh, the rest of the stuff the next day. That sort of makes sense. So I uh, get all those links in there. I might have gotten the YouTube link wrong because it didn't turn it into a 
it didn't but whatever the twitch link is there so yeah so let me let me just open this in a new tab so we can see the visual studio 2022 launch you know visual studio.microsoft.launch okay fine on monday they're going to live stream at 8 30 p.m uh 8 30 a.m pacific so that's 11 30 for most of us i'm sure unless folks are watching from around the world um definitely they're you know we're going to see all of our friends talking about visual studio from uh i don't know amanda scott david folks that we've even had you know speak with us before the usual and then, yeah usual suspects and then dotnet six launches the next day day one day two day three and there's a whole bunch of folks who are going to be um one of the days they begin a 24-hour broadcast i think it's day two where every time zone is represented and um speakers from all around the world a lot of a lot of folks from the mvp program and again we see the usual suspects here right so yeah, that's a pretty exciting week next week.